So we have something slightly different for you today and I really enjoyed this interview with Grace Prendergast. As we go through this, you'll see why, because Grace is an Olympic world champion. She won the gold medal at the Tokyo 2020 Olympics for rowing. And Grace really is an elite sportswoman. She's also won many other gold medals in the world championships too. So at the top of her game, she was exceptional. Now, what we're gonna be doing in this interview is analyzing what got her to the top, how she overcome adversity, how she dealt with teammates, how she managed to track all her data and overcome plateaus. All of these lessons are absolutely crucial for your construction business. So as you're listening through this, don't think about it from a sporting background. Think about all the lessons that you're gonna to learn to apply in your own construction business with the struggles she faced and how she overcome them. You're gonna find this fascinating, so really look forward to you diving into this. Grace, awesome to have you on the show. Really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Great to have you on. So Grace, would you like to give us a little introduction on uh, who you are and what some of your accomplishments have been? Yes, definitely. So my name is Grace Prendergast and I'm originally from New Zealand, but I'm currently living in the UK, so very different lifestyle in London. I My background is in sports. I was a professional rower for about for about 12 years, which is always crazy. I think I'm always like, no, um, I haven't been, I haven't left school that long ago. And then I'm like, oh, wow, you have. But no, so background in professional sports, rowing, I did two Olympics. So the, the Rio Olympic Games where we came fourth, which is always a hard position to be in. And then most recently, the Tokyo Olympic Games where I won a gold medal in the women's pair and a silver in the women's eight. And then following that, came over to the UK and did a year at Cambridge University and rode there and then retired after that. So now adjusting to life on the other side. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. So first of all, congratulations on your Olympic medals. It's awesome. to what, what an achievement to know that you're the best in the world at something. So congratulations on that. Thank you. I'm sure that was a lot of uh, training and hard work and dedication that <laughs> went into getting that. Yeah, it still feels a bit surreal. I think every time I say it, I'm like, oh, wow, you, you did do that. But I guess nice surreal. But yeah, it still, still hasn't really sunk in, even though it's been a few years. Yeah, absolutely awesome. So the reason I wanted to get you on, Grace, is because it's fascinating the synergies between sport and business and how the life lessons we learn in sport transfer over to lessons we learn in business today so for those who are listening this is something a little bit different but as we go through this and as grace is answering some of these questions and her experiences i want my listeners to just think about how that might be transferable and how they might be able to apply it as they go through their challenges in in business so maybe first of all grace we could talk about uh, your routine as a champion because routine is so crucial isn't it so what is what was your sort of daily routine can you walk us through what you used to do when you were building up to a, a major competition yeah I think routine is super super important because if you sort of establish a routine when things when there's a little, little bit less pressure and a little bit more time on your hands it's really easy to maintain that when it does get to the stressful point but I guess rowing is a really routine sport so I'm probably I love routine as well but we would row twice essentially twice a day and maybe do a third session in there as well so it would be up relatively early down on the water for maybe two and a half hours come in have a bit of a break maybe hop on the rowing machine for another hour or hour and a half come in and then either go rowing again or maybe a weight session or something like that and then you can come home and you can switch off and relax for the rest of your evening but obviously that's the rowing routine and then I had my own personal routine established around that which I think is really important as we just touched on to kind of keep you structured in your day and when things are going well it's it's very easy to get through a day but when things aren't going that well I think it's really nice to have something to come back to um but it takes a while to figure out how to develop that personal routine I'd say oh, okay, okay I can imagine and what's interesting is obviously all the rowers out there, they've all potentially got a routine that's going, but there's something that differentiates someone who goes and wins a gold medal to, to someone who doesn't. So what do you think those non-negotiables were in your routine that maybe contributed more to your success? Was there things that you, you did that were different to others or what do, what do you think? Yeah, I'd say uh, I think there were things and I think these things could be different for everybody, but like what I believe 
I did that made me successful was one of the things where I, in my routine I definitely worked to have times where I was like super switched off like I didn't sit there and think about rowing all the time or didn't stew over what happened that morning um there were like points in my day where I was like okay regardless of how it's going now is a time where you can think about anything else you want and I studied as well so it might have been my study it might have been literally just reading a book or anything but so you're just not there constantly stewing on what Mm. is probably the biggest part of your life but you do need to switch off as well because I found when there were points in my rowing career when I wasn't doing that as well you just feel so drained and obviously all the physical training is really tiring and if you can go home and sort of drain yourself mentally it's it's not a very sustainable way you're going to burn out whereas if you have something that you're like okay when I get to this point I'm going to switch off and like whether that is like for me it was almost like a point in the road it was like you do your rowing you can think about it for a while and you can debrief debrief, and then on your way home when you get to this point that's when it's like okay that part of my day is done I'm on to the next thing and I think that was really important I would say also consistency is another thing that if you want to get to the top, it's probably, I would say, one of the most important things that you need to find because, you know, you think of people that go off and do really good things or something really good like once and you're like, oh, that's really good, but to be able to do it again and again and again is probably what makes successful people successful. So, I mean that meant that before every session I sort of needed to know what I was going to get out of it so like part of my routine was sitting down and whether this was just by myself or with my crew and being like hey what's our goal for the session so we're not just going to go out there and go through the motions and and also it can cause conflict when you don't know what the purpose of the session is maybe I've got a purpose in my mind and my teammate has a purpose in their mind and then when we're tired and grumpy on the water we're going to start fighting each other. Whereas if we've sat down and it's going to be 30 seconds, you've talked about the purpose of the session, then you can come back to that. So I would say that's another big thing in in my routine that sort of got me to the success. success. It wasn't going through the motions. I knew what you're going to get out of the session. Yeah, that's huge. So as you're going through all of this, Grace, I'm thinking back to, right, how do we now apply this in our businesses? And there's just absolute gold in here. So I just want to stop and just recap on some of that, because I think I don't want this to go over people's heads and, and they missed the point of it. So one thing you said that was really important is the the importance of having a routine to take yourself out of the the stresses of, of what you're concentrating on. So you need a bit of time for yourself and actually having a routine to switch off. So did you do anything in particular to force yourself to chill out? Were you into sort of meditating or journaling or yoga or was was there any sort of habits like that you built into to to de-stress yeah a bit of all of them actually definitely journaling I think that is a really nice way of being like oh I've written it down on paper so I'm not just pushing it to the side like I'm not forgetting about anything like I'm going to come back to this because when something's not going that well you do need to figure it out but there's also a time and a place for it so I felt like if I wrote it down it sort of was like you're saving it for later I think that one was also really important because it could show you routines you could and patterns in your in your training or your day-to-day life and sometimes when you're living and breathing something it's really hard to step back and like look at it objectively but if I could look back and think oh every time this month when we're in this we would do like monthly training phases so it would get harder and harder and harder and then back off you know every every time it's a hard week I think this is always wrong this is always wrong this is always an issue but it's actually just a passion in my training and if that's all written down you can establish those patterns yeah. if that makes sense yeah yeah and and I guess that's what what brings in what you said before about the importance of having the consistency because if you've got that consistent routine that's happening you're you're able to draw on those data streams all the way through aren't you and work out because sometimes we can I'm thinking now in business, I'm not talking about <laughs> in road, obviously, because I've got no experience of that. But in, in business, sometimes you you look at a data point and you think, oh, that's gone wrong. But because you haven't got previous sets of data to actually work out, have, am I judging this right? Or is it a one-off occurrence? So I guess your routine was important in giving you that analysis. Yes, definitely. Like for my peer partner and I, I know every 
every year before world champs is a really really hard training period which is a really hard thing to get around mentally because you sort of you're sort of getting to the maybe a week and a half before you need to race at world champs and you're like oh, I'm exhausted like I'm sore I'm exhausted and we would go through this every year being like we're going terribly like it feels hard we don't feel like energetic lively and then obviously the physiologists and stuff are so so professional they know that we will bounce up but it's mm. getting to that point and then we started to recognize that pattern so then the following year we'd be like oh, I actually remember you felt like this last year yeah. but you came up and by the time you were at world champs you were absolutely fine like so it gives you confidence as well yeah so important yeah that's that's so key so that's that's really useful and um, some some real value in, in that there thinking about your motivation on how you kept yourself going because obviously this is years of training to, to get to this point I mean how many how many years were you training before before you won the the gold well professionally 11 so yeah and I, I would say and like I wanted I had set this goal of winning the women's pair the boat class was at the Olympics probably in about 2014 so I guess that's seven years specifically to achieve this goal and then years before that yeah that's absolutely incredible so how did you keep your motivation up <laughs> during all that time to, to to go and achieve that? Yeah, it's. I think this is a really interesting question and I found it more interesting since I've retired from rowing because I think you know, I'd get asked that a lot and I would have all these little tricks and things, but I think since stepping away, I I have sort of come back to the fact that it was, it was because it was a goal that I cared about so much. Like since stepping away and I potentially haven't found that new like real drive for something I'll set goals and it's very easy to come off them and lose motivation. Whereas for that one, I was like, I knew I wanted it so much. And there were, it wasn't just because I I wanted a gold medal. It was like so many things that went into that. Like it was like, oh, it's because I'm putting in so much hard work and it's going to be such a, you know, sense of satisfaction. And I want it because it means so much to my team and me. There were so many different layers to why I wanted to achieve that goal. And I think that's, the most important thing when you're trying to maintain your intrinsic motivation is to actually really care about your goal and know why you want to achieve it. And that can be so different for everyone. Like why I want to win might be so different than why someone else wants to win. But as long as everyone knows their motivation, I think that's the real key. And I I guess that evolves over time, doesn't it? Because I imagine when you first started rowing, you probably didn't have the goal of being a gold medalist did you did, I mean when when did it start th- these aspirations of achieving that yeah it definitely does evolve over time like I, I was never one of those kids that sort of sat in primary school or high school and was like oh I want to go to the Olympics because I think it just seemed like such a far off thing whereas I made my first New Zealand team in my last year of school and but that was still very age group that was still like so many people will do this and then stop after that but that kind of gave me the confidence and then eventually like a few years later I was like oh no I'm in the 23s and I'm in the high age groups and then it sort of just was a natural progression to be like actually this is now an achievable goal still very very hard but like I was like I can achieve this so it definitely did progress over time and for a long time it still felt like you're a little bit of like almost like an imposter to be like is this your goal because this is like the people you used to look up to that were trying to do this and I imagine that's the same for a lot of people trying to establish a business or try to do anything it's it's quite uncomfortable to you know feel confident to say oh I want to win an Olympic gold medal or I want to set up my own business because you have to believe that you're good enough to do it I suppose. Sure 100% and and that goal just seems so out there as in you know to come up with that initially so I imagine that there were steps along the way or goals that you had to set before you were going to achieve the big one so how did, how did you break that down? Yeah definitely I think this is a really really important thing that we did as well because first of all it, it does seem so like outlandish to to work towards that but also it's so far away you know like this is the main thing in our four-year cycle and we have world champs and things but that's all learning for the Olympic Games so you're trying to work towards something that is four years away and when you're out there on the water and it's cold and it's raining and it's so you know you're like this isn't for another three years doesn't matter if I sort of like chill out now or if we actually just decide to stay inside so having the little steps along the way was really important and I think also for us it was really important to work towards them and achieve them so that we could line up in our situation and Tokyo really confident it's 
I think part of it, part of achieving little goals is not only to keep yourself on track, but also to build your confidence there. When you line up, you're like, but I've done this and I set this goal and I achieved that. So like, why can't I do this today? But yeah, it was all very, very structured. It was like, okay, we had certain markers at certain points that we wanted to achieve. And that became really important when COVID hit because I was like, a lot of our other markers got taken away. We couldn't race anyone internationally. So you, And then we also had a whole nother year to fill in. So having those little personal markers became even more important. Yeah, I can imagine. And this is so exactly the same as business. I mean, as we're going through business, we want to set those KPIs. Without KPIs, you're, you're just floating around and you don't really know what you're actually aiming for. So it's setting those KPIs. But I think it's great to, and the the analogy you've made there is, if we're going for a big goal, maybe we want to have a £10 million construction business or whatever it is, that, or be a big property developer, whatever our goal is, we need to realise that that may be a five or 10 year journey your yours were four year cycles but there's plenty of other kpis that you can set along the way and what i thought you said was important is like celebrate those little wins too we need to them as we're going yeah i think that was that's really really important and that was a, a learning for me definitely along my sporting career because leading into rio i think we weren't as good at celebrating the little wins and we sort of set this main goal of winning a medal at the rio olympics and we came away with a fourth and when we came away with the fourth, I was like, oh, I'm sort of gutted because we did so many amazing things on our on our way here, but we didn't celebrate them because we were like, the Olympics is our main goal. Like, don't get too cocky or anything. But I was like, God, four and any sort of difficult challenge or goal is can be so, it can wear you down a lot. So if you don't celebrate the little things along the way, it, it, it can get pretty, pretty ruthless. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, yeah, without doubt, exactly. I completely relate to that. So, as part of your role, you were in a team. Obviously, there's a team around you that supports you as you're going to the Olympics. And um, how did you find different personalities and trying to manage all of that? And you know, how did you get you, you all of you aligned to pull in the same direction? Because I can imagine that's a little bit of a challenge with team dynamics sometimes. Yeah, there's a real challenge, I think, in, in both of my boats. So my, my main boat was just me and one other person. Which it was We had a really interesting dynamic because we're really, really good friends, but we're very, very different people. And how we respond to stress is very different, how like our strengths were very different. So it caused, I guess, not friction, but like it, when you think differently to someone, it can be difficult in, in times to like align on the same page. And... We definitely went through a, a journey with it, but I, I would almost put this down to like why we actually became successful was because we were different. So it took a lot of time and effort to finding a way that it really, really worked for us and it really made it was it made it into one of our strengths. But a lot of that we had to sit down and actually learn, like she had to learn like why I think a certain way and I actually also had to learn why I think a certain way as well and then I had to learn like what how she thinks and why she thinks like that because when you know when the pressure's on and I'm you know and I've decided to actually like this is all too much for me I'm just going to close off and I'm just going to internalize this and then she's there being like no we need to talk about this we need to sort it out now and 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 those differences it can be really frustrating in the moment but for us, I think I, my biggest advice around this topic would be like, it's really important to sort of do the work outside and understand why people think a certain way and, and what they need in those times or situations if they want space, if they want to be taught to, because then then you know how to cope in those situations. And I think one of the things that I was said to me and I was like, oh, this is really interesting. It's like, do you think you would be successful if, let's say an eight for an example if there were eight graces on the boat do you think you would go and win an olympic gold medal and I was like oh definitely not because I'm so bad at this I need someone to fill that gap and I'm so bad at that I need someone to fill that gap but I think that's the biggest one of the biggest learnings for me I was like all those little internal conflicts can be quite beneficial because it makes you question the way you think it makes you get to like the best possible so solution but it takes a lot of time and effort to figure it out I can imagine. How, how long were you together as teammates? So we rode together consistently in the pier eight years. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah yeah so it's a, it was a long time I feel like we, we left and I was like no one knows me better no one knows my worst times better <laughs> That's, that's absolutely fascinating. And I think the point you mentioned there about seeing things from other people's perspectives is so valuable as a life lesson and a business lesson, because sometimes we can be quite adamant that it's got to be done our way um, and our way's right. But actually just seeing how other people view things and there's there's so much value in having a team member that doesn't think like you <laughs> so that you can yes. you know navigate those those challenges. So yeah, amazing that you were able to pull in the same direction for so long because there's a lot of reliance on each other really, isn't there? Because if one of you just decided that oh, this isn't for me anymore or or you were on really bad form and you had to cope while you were on bad form and the other person, you know, wasn't, I imagine that's really challenging. Yeah, there is a lot of reliance on, on each other. I think especially in the boat that I rode in because there was only two of us and we had one oar each. So like there is a boat with two and you have two oars. So you can get away with doing things a little bit differently because you're both moving the boat forward but for us it was like you're in control of your side if one person's doing a terrible job you're, you're literally going to go around in circles or go nowhere but I think that made it even more important for us to figure this out and and like we used to have this little gold rock that it was like our our reminder that it's like we both actually have the exact same goal like we're so so driven towards achieving what we want to achieve so when we're having these discussions and I've got a different opinion or we want to do things different ways. It was actually quite not easy. It still took a lot of effort, but we were like, okay, we're both putting these opinions. We're both so passionate about it because we have this gold nugget that we want to achieve. And that's the main thing. It's like the boat is the most important thing and you both want the best out of this. So that really helped us in times when it was a little bit stressful because it was like, we're actually fighting for the same thing. And it's just because we care that these situations arise. So important. Yeah, both got to be aligned behind the same goal completely. So mm. one, one thing that fascinates me is how did you get on with, obviously, you want to push your teammates to perform, but there must have been times when you're rowing where your teammate or you couldn't keep up with what the other one was doing if you you know you weren't quite feeling it. So how did you how did you navigate the difference between pushing them and, and not breaking them and or knowing when to ease up to let them cope and keep up with you? Yeah, this one's a hard one. I think especially when people have different strengths, you know, some people are going to find doing certain things a little bit easier and that's going to be really challenging for others. And when you're naturally good at something, it can often be quite difficult to understand that someone else struggles with that. So I think it's, yeah, it's really difficult. Um, I'm trying to think what we would do. I think it's having a lot of understanding. I think asking a lot from people is fine when you sometimes in our situation all we had to do was acknowledge like this is hard but it's actually really important and I appreciate you putting in the effort even if you're constantly failing or constantly not like you're tripping up you're not doing well like it's important that we get this right and I respect how much effort is going into it and I know for me when I was really struggling with something and people were asking a lot as soon as they acknowledged that I was giving it a good go I sort of got this like second wind of energy and I was like oh okay I can keep trying because like you know I'm not just sitting here banging my head against a brick wall and no one's noticing or no one's appreciating the effort but it just took like I never wanted people to back the pressure off because I was like we're not going to get anywhere if we constantly say actually no it's fine like let's just take a break or, or any of that so I think acknowledging is is a really important one and I think also we sort of touched on actually really learning about what makes people tick and how people are motivated and what their personality cues are. So they're like, oh, maybe they might need something slightly different. It's like, we're still going to try and do what we're doing, but do they also need to be surrounded by a team when they're doing it? Or do they need a little bit of time to go off and try and do it by themselves? Understanding those little things, I think, is also really important. Yeah, definitely, for sure. So thinking about the dynamics in the boat, because obviously if there's if there's two of you in the boat and you're both given, you know, both got one oar each, you're both doing the same. And um, you know, in business, you have to have leaders, you know, to, to for any business to work. So is it the same in a boat? It, is one is there one that takes the lead above the other? How, how does that dynamic work? I think rowing's really interesting in that regard because I would say we do have leaders because I also spent a lot of time in an eight as well, which obviously you've got more like a bigger range of dynamics than an eight. 
I'd say we do have leaders, but then it's a, it's a weird sport. Then you get in the boat and you're all doing exactly the same thing. And even communication can be somewhat difficult because, and obviously if there's only two of you, it's slightly easier, but you can only communicate with the people around you. And in rowing, if you just try harder and no one else tries harder at the same time, it's going to probably slow you down. So it's a, it's a weird sort of dynamic that it's difficult to be like a physical leader but I guess off the water you can do a lot in the team talks you can do a lot and I we probably did have natural leaders or strengths that each woman had that they would play to but yeah it's an interesting thing because I think in my mind a really good leader is almost someone that allows other people to feel like they can be a leader as well it's not sitting there being a someone that's going to give instructions it's going to it's someone that sort of builds everyone up so they feel like they can have an opinion or they can say what they're thinking or be really confident to be who they are so yeah it's all those sort of different leadership dynamics yeah 100 percent. so that's a really a sign of a great leader isn't it if you can empower others to be their best too you know that's that's what it's all about isn't it rather than being a, a dictator so yeah certainly some, yeah. some, some similarities there so thinking about uh, your performance and obviously going over the the you know the four year cycles that you were doing you must have hit plateaus as you were going through things think I can't you know I can't break this time at the moment or I, you know we're just we're just not getting anywhere what did you do when you hit a plateau and how did you sort of navigate that and overcome plateaus you faced in your in your performance yeah I had plenty of plenty of plateaus <laughs> and it can be quite demoralizing because sometimes you haven't necessarily changed what you're doing it's just the cycle you're in or like for me it was like a lot about like your physical training so it's just your body sort of wanting to just hold there before it before it started to peak I would almost potentially also come back to the journaling here to be like oh I've plateaued before and I had to I didn't make any improvements for this four month period or six month period or year but then look at the results I got afterwards I think that was a really good one for me because and rowing, I guess the biggest thing you can see is when you can see your numbers. And and I I really, we do a 2K erg on the rowing machine, which is like the worst thing because it's just you, this number. And I went through a stage, it's for about three years, I just couldn't, I got the same score every time. And it wasn't a great score either. So it wasn't like I was good plateau and I was like, I need to get better. And I remember I had a coach who was really, really good. He was like, everyone plateau is like, you cannot keep going like that it's just it's actually impossible and I was like yeah sure okay and then I finally broke it and once I broke it I was like away and away but I think it's having the bigger picture in mind and not getting too caught up in the short-term gains it's knowing what your end goal is and and being like okay if I plateau for a year I'm still you know my end goal is five years away and it's if I keep doing all the day-to-day the process right if I trust in my process then my main goal will come but yeah I would say that probably my main things is like actually recognizing that you've got through plateaus before so coming back to the information and then also being so confident in your process that you're like well what would I change if I wanted to get out of the plateau is there anything that I believe I'm doing that's not right and if you can think no then you've got to almost trust in that and and know that it'll eventually pay off. Yeah. So what you're saying there, so it was just more of the same with the plateau. So you didn't like back off for a while and then go again, or was it, did you change any strategy at all? Or do you would you just keep plowing on with the routine because you knew it was going to come good? I think it was always a really good time to evaluate what you were doing. And whether that meant I did change a few little things, if I uh, realized maybe, oh, you actually are overtraining, that's why you're not doing well. And that's when you have to draw on your support team as well. You have to go and ask the right questions and talk to the right people and evaluate what's going on. And sometimes it was like, no, change nothing. It's actually, we're at the moment designed to plateau and you will peak soon. Or sometimes it would be like, oh, actually, we aren't doing this right and we could be doing more here or could be doing less here. But having a, a, I guess, a plateau is giving you a chance to really evaluate what you're doing every every single day. 
Hundred percent, yeah. So we see the same in business all the time. You know, I, I talk to a lot of business owners where they've just hit the same turnover targets every year. They're they're coming back and think we're not growing as a business. We don't seem to be getting anywhere. We're spinning the wheels, but not really making progress. I think what you said there's so true. Something you just you need the data first of all, don't you? And you need to be able to analyze it and think: Can we tweak anything? Is you know, or are we on the right track? And it's just going to come good eventually. So synergies with that. So just coming back to the Olympics, you said the first Olympics was a fourth place, was it? Was that what you said? Or the... Yeah. So that obviously must have, I mean, that's amazing, <laughs> first of all, but obviously not for if you, when you go for the gold. So how did you cope with failure and adversity as you were going through your career? Because I, I imagine you did a lot of competitions and have faced a lot of failure. Yeah. And this is obviously something that you had you have to face. I, I guess in every walk of life, but a lot in sport, you're you're never going to be successful all the time. I think the Rio failure at the time, I definitely thought it was a failure, taught me a lot. But I think a lot of my opinion of whether I failed or succeeded was if I looked back and I was like, could have I done better? And that was Rio for me. I was like, oh, there's actually so many things in the build up that I, I don't think I did that well. So it was it was a good learning of what, you know, how do you evaluate? How do you look back and make sure that that doesn't happen again? Whereas if I lined up and I came forth and I was like, I couldn't have changed anything, then it's obviously a completely different mindset. I think dealing with failure for me, a lot came back to the feeling of failure is like such a strong one and it's so easy to remember how you felt and how it made you feel for a long time afterwards and that's a huge motivation for me and anytime I sort of felt that I was so so good at evaluating what I'd been doing um, you know debriefing with people around me figuring out what went wrong and and that motivation hung around for so long whereas obviously the feeling of winning and doing well is amazing but it seems to peter off a lot quicker so I think that's sort of what would get me through every unsuccessful moment or every failure is I was like this is such a good way to learn a lesson not a nice way but it it actually forces you into learning it and if I look back on my career now and I had to say like why I was able to win a gold in Tokyo I would probably say like 90 percent of the key moments were things that went wrong and they taught me enough to to make me successful in Tokyo. So it's having that bigger perspective that it's like, yeah, this is horrible now. It doesn't feel nice. But actually, as long as I learn from it and make sure it doesn't happen again, this is going to be really beneficial. The issue with failure is if you just keep letting it happen again and again and again, then it's it's not going to be beneficial. It's going to be pretty tiring and pretty horrible. But if you learn from it, then that is what would get me through all those all those moments. Yeah, without a doubt. Then you're continuing to grow. There's a little quote, interestingly, from Tony Robbins. I use this quote all the time in business. <laughs> One thing that was interesting that you said there, Grace, was that sometimes that the fear of failure was really painful, but you also had the remembrance of when you win, you know, how good that feels. And it's interesting to work out the dynamics of what is the motivation? Is it the fear of failure or is it what you could get out of it? And there's always a quote I use from Tony Robbins where he says, the secret of success is learning how to use pain and pleasure instead of having pain and pleasure use you. If you do that, you're in control of your life. If you don't, life controls you. So he's a big believer in that we can use the forces of pain and pleasure as a massive motivation to control our actions. What, what did you think it was that motivated you? Was it was it both pain and pleasure or were you more motivated by the, the fear of the failure or what you're going to win? Where would you say your motivation come from? Yeah, interesting. I think that's quite a cool quote. I would say, oh, I've stood on the fence in this one, but I think it, it, had, it kind of has to be a combination for me because I think both things show how much I care about what I'm doing I was like I only feel this massive failure or fear of failure is because I really want to achieve what I want to achieve and that's the same I only feel this real sense of like satisfaction and pride and excitement when I do well because I've worked so hard towards this it's like I'm not gonna if I went out there and if I trained for six months in a sport and then won an Olympic gold medal I'd be like oh that was that was really cool that was great 
but because I had trained for eight years towards this one race the feeling of winning meant so much more so I think it both come back to showing me just how much I care about the journey I'm on and and also it, that gave me I guess solace that whether it worked out or whether it didn't I was like this has been a pretty cool journey like if I get to the end and if I fail if I don't win my Olympic gold medal and I have those extreme emotions it's just because I was like on this such cool journey and and yeah I didn't get what I wanted but I was fortunate enough to be able to chase a goal that was pretty extreme for so long and that gave me a little bit of I guess like a security blanket to be like regardless of what happens you're doing the right thing and and it's a cool it's a cool thing to be able to do whereas some people have to sit there every day and not get to work towards something that, that excites them that much so I think yeah definitely the the fa- fear of failure and the I guess hope of winning just told me I was on the right path <laughs> fantastic yeah that makes complete sense so just want to touch on the role of coaches in your performance and how coaches helped you obviously I'm a business coach so we have a lot of you know coaches on the podcast as well giving advice on how people can grow their businesses but how, how is coaching absolutely integral to you achieving the gold and how, how did it help you with your performance really important and I, I think I had a real range of coaches throughout my career and they all had very different styles and I think even the ones that maybe I, I didn't love as much as the others, you can you can learn a lot from. So I think that, that was probably that's probably my first point, even if you can we have a coach or a boss or something that you're like, I don't love you, but like what can I take away from you? Because some of my coaches that I were under that I was like, This is a tough environment, it's not that nice. I now look back on and I was like, But man, I became resilient and I left them being able to cope with anything and this was a great thing that they taught me. So I think first of all being able to pick up different things from different coaches is really important but overall I think a coach has the power to really have a big influence on your life and and for me the ones that I found to be great were the ones that I had like such trust in that I knew they were never going to go easy easy on me if I if they thought I could do it but I also knew they weren't going to make me do things or put me in situations that they didn't think I was going to get some benefit out of so I think building up that trust with your in my situation athletes but or employees or whatever situation you're in is really important and figuring out how to do that and I found I trusted the coaches that turned up every day and I knew they wanted the same goal as me and I knew they respected me as a person but they were also consistent and I know people have good and bad days and that's fine. Like those little fluctuations are fine, but they, you know, what you're going to get out of them. You know what you're going to get from them, which was really important to me and, and my journey. But yeah, it's amazing how a coach can make you feel so motivated to turn up one day and then a bad coach can make you just dread, dread going. So it's, it's actually quite an art. I think people don't realize how hard it is to, lead people or coach people <laughs> yeah yeah that, yeah amazing it's really interesting listening to you grace because just in the short time that we've had together you're very analytical and as we've gone through this the, the one of the biggest lessons i've seen from this is that every experience you had whether it is with your teammate whether it was not winning the gold whether whether it was when you won the gold everything and even the coaches it was all a learning experience everything was what can i learn from this how can it make me a better person or how can it make me a better row of all of that? So it's yeah, quite interesting. And and I think if I was looking at what sort of set you above others, maybe that is the point, is it? That you are always using it as a learning experience. Yeah, I probably would agree actually. I've never really thought about it like that, but even how I, when I sort of was going through the stage of being like, do you want to commit to rowing? Like how are you, if you're going to do this, how are you going to get to be, the best I sort of went through I was like what are you really good at what are you not so good at and a lot of the things I'm not good at are probably deemed as some of the important things like I was like I'm not overly strong I was like my, I'm not bad technically but I'm not visually the most standard rower I've got a few quirks in my technique and, and I'm terrible in the gym I'm not that good at, at on on the rowing machine so I was like well how are you going to get good and and for me I was like okay well maybe I can actually learn how everyone else rows and I can be that person that 
anytime anyone gets in a boat with me, they're like, oh, I feel so comfortable. And I, the boat feels so nice. So I can row so well and I can row so hard and I can go harder. And then I was like, I could probably get to the stage where if people got in the boat, they're like, oh, I'm with Grace. I, I should be good now. And I was like, you're pretty much doing my job for me. But I think it was, I was like, I used to have this little book and everyone I would row with, I'd be like, oh, um, so-and-so, this is how they row. This is what works well with them. So that next time I could jump in, it, it would it would go well. But it's probably that going through that process of identifying like what your strengths are that are going to get you to the top rather than being like, oh, this is everything I'm bad at. I need to work yeah. on this all the time because it's tiring only working on your weaknesses. So yeah, um, the self-awareness of being able to do that is absolutely critical. So it's amazing that you were able to do that throughout. So Grace, obviously you've achieved some amazing things. And as you said at the beginning of this podcast, you've got to have the motivation now to set new goals and new challenges. So what's in store for the future for you, Grace? What targets are you now setting for yourself? I think since, since leaving rowing, I've really learned what made me love rowing. And part of it was the the team dynamic, how to create a team that's working towards a goal and how how you get all those different personalities to function together. And, and that's what I believe made me actually love it. I also loved the like training and all of that. But since leaving, I, I was like, well, how can I harness those? So currently I've been doing a bit of like leadership development and going into um, different businesses and sort of talking about my story and what I believe went well and what didn't go well and how I handled that and and how I ended up with the success I got so um, that's been a really nice process to go through since leaving because when you're living and breathing something it's really hard to sort of debrief your career um, mm. So it's also given me the chance to reflect on actually what went into success. So I, I really enjoy doing that. I think I'm still in the transition phase of deciding what is my next big goal, because even that is like, that's just an area that I've been doing some work in. And that I was like, how do you turn that into that one clear goal that I had in sport? And I, I think I'm learning that it's a little bit harder in the real world to have such clear goals. <laughs> Well, no, it's absolutely fascinating. I've got no doubt, Grace, that you're going to be really successful in whatever you turn your hand to because uh, you've clearly got that mindset and ability. So really interesting having you on today, Grace. And there are a ton of lessons here that we can take away for business. So anyone that's listened to this, I want you to listen to it again. And just as you're going through it, just think, how do I apply this to my business? You might not be a world-class rower like Grace is, but we can still get a ton of value on how we can do it with leadership, with teams, with coaches, with data points, all of that. There was a, there was a ton of stuff there. So Grace, thank you so much for your time. And I wish you all the best going forward. Oh, thank you so much for having me on.